So at this point, then, this will be the time for the opening statements. Ms. Blake, I understand that you will be making opening statements on behalf of the state. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. All right. Are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Blake, then you can commence with your opening statement. Thank you. Money, power, and sex. That's what this case is about. The defendant, Lori Vallow Daybell, used money, power, and sex, or the promise of those things, to get what she wanted. What she wanted was money, power, and sex. It didn't matter what obstacle she had to remove to get what she wanted. It didn't matter if the obstacle was a thing or a person. And if it was a person, it didn't matter who. Tylee Ryan was a vibrant young woman, 17 years old, a whole life ahead of her. She was just about to enter into adulthood and make her own way in the world. Who knows what she would have become. Tylee had already lost her father, and she received Social Security benefits because of that. Tylee had money. Lori wanted it. Tylee's gone. Joshua Jackson Vallow, lovingly known by friends and family as JJ, was a seven-year-old, vibrant, happy-go-lucky little boy. He had most of his childhood and his whole life ahead of him. But JJ was, was tough. He's, he's a seven-year-old. He took a lot of time and effort and energy to care for. That time, effort, and energy took away from the defendant doing what she wanted to do and from the defendant being with Chad Daybell and devoting her time and attention to him. JJ had also lost his father. And when JJ lost his father, he became even that much more difficult to care for, no longer a second parent to help. Not only that, JJ also was entitled to Social Security benefits. The defendant didn't want to have to take care of JJ anymore. She wanted the money. JJ's gone. Tamara Douglas Daybell, known by friends and family as Tammy, a 49-year-old mother of five, a grandmother, a computer whiz by all accounts. She was married to Chad Daybell. The defendant wanted Chad all to herself. Chad was the beneficiary of a life insurance policy for Tammy. Lori wanted those things. Tammy's gone. <clears throat> Tylee was last seen on September 8th of 2019. She had just relocated with her mother to Rexburg, Idaho on or about September 1st of 2019. And seven days later is the last sighting, known sighting of Tylee. The next time Tylee is seen is on June 9th of 2020. She's found buried in a shallow grave on Chad Daybell's property. And when I say she's found, what I mean is what was left of Tylee was found. Charred remains. That's what was left of Tylee. You will hear it described as a mass of bone and tissue. That's what was left of this beautiful young woman, the defendant's daughter. You will also hear how Tylee's DNA was recovered on a pickaxe pick and shovel <coughs> later located in a shed on defendant Daybell's property. JJ was last seen on September 22nd of 2019 at the defendant's apartment in Rexburg, Idaho. Last time JJ was seen, he was with his uncle, Alex Cox, the defendant's brother. You'll hear from a witness that he saw Alex Cox carrying JJ. JJ's head on his shoulder appeared to be a peaceful scene. 
It appeared JJ was sleeping at that time. JJ was not seen again until June 9th of 2020, when he was also found in a shallow grave on the defendant's property. JJ was found wrapped in garbage bags with duct tape around him. He had duct tape around his head. He had duct tape around his arms, taping them into a position like this. That's how the defendant's little boy was found. You will hear what a difficult scene that was to process. Law enforcement had been searching for these children since November of 2019. And even the most veteran law enforcement officers you'll hear from were disturbed by the scene. Some may have still been holding out hope against all odds that we'd find these children alive, but this wasn't what they expected to find. Tammy was last seen alive on the night of October 18th of 2019. Her son left to work. She was home alone with Chad Daybell on that night. On the morning of October 19th, just before 6 a.m., a 911 call is placed. Tammy's dead. She's cold and she's stiff. What we know is by the time law enforcement showed up, Chad Daybell had moved her body. Chad Daybell gives a description that Tammy wasn't feeling well, she'd been sick. Very few other witnesses report any concerns about Tammy's health. And mind you, at the time law enforcement show up at Tammy's death, when it's been reported, it's unknown at that time about JJ and Tylee missing. It's unknown that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell are in any kind of a relationship. So nothing about Tammy's death is initially deemed to be suspicious. You will hear that the defendant was in Hawaii at the time Tammy died. And you will also hear that less than three weeks later, 17 days to be exact, the defendant and Chad Daybell were back in Hawaii. They were getting married on a sunny beach in Hawaii, dancing and celebrating their life together while Tylee and JJ were cold in the ground in shallow graves and while Tammy had just barely been laid to rest in the Springville, Utah Cemetery, her hometown. The missing children, the sudden death of Tammy, the quick marriage of Chad and the defendant left so many questions for those still grieving the loss of Tammy and those still wondering 24 seven about the whereabouts and safety of the children. You will also hear how the defendant had switched Tylee's money from Tylee's JP Morgan Chase account to go into the defendant's BBVA account on or about August 16th of 2019. Tylee went missing on September 8th of 2019. You will also hear how she had begun receiving benefits on JJ's behalf approximately a month before he was last seen. And you will hear how she continued to collect those benefits and that money to fund her lifestyle. You are going to hear a lot of different dates and events that occurred on those dates, phone calls that were placed on those dates, messages that were sent, financial transactions that occurred. The reason you're going to hear about so many dates and so many events is because I've talked about dates in 2019 and 2020. This case actually starts in October of 2018. In October of 2018, the defendant met Chad Daybell for the first time. You'll hear that she had read his books. She was a fan of his, but she traveled to a Preparing the People conference in St. George, Utah. She traveled there with her friends, Melanie Gibb and Sulema Pastenis. These are two women that you will hear more about and you will hear from them during this trial. When she traveled there with them, she met Chad for the first time. You'll hear it described that there appeared to be some kind of an instant connection. The two of them talked a lot. The defendant was flirty. But what you will also hear is that during this first meeting, 
the defendant and Chad decide that they share purported religious beliefs and that they share beliefs that the two of them had been here, had been married before in a prior probation. You will hear it talked about multi-creations or a prior probation or a prior life. But regardless of the term used, what they began to tell others is that they were essentially meant to be together. They'd been married in prior lives, prior probations. Not only that, but they both said that they had been prior figures from or persons from the Bible or other religious references. This will include that they designated themselves as James and Elena. And you will hear that they pursued this line of thought and they pursued these teachings to others to the extent that Chad Daybell wrote a story, the James and Elena story for Lori, for the defendant. And you will hear through testimony how that story mirrored some true life events that were going on between the defendant and Chad Daybell. And at the time they met, it's important to remember, they were both married to other people. Their spouses were both alive and well when they first met. But again, remember, the defendant will remove any obstacle in her way to get what she wants. And she wanted Chad Daybell. She had decided that. Soon after that first meeting in October of 2018, you will hear how the defendants began communicating regularly. Their relationship moved quickly. You will hear how Chad traveled to Arizona that next month in November of 2018. He traveled for a conference, but the defendant also held a gathering at her house and Chad Daybell was present. You will hear how shortly after the defendant with the help of Chad Daybell began telling people and, and reporting religious beliefs and teaching people about a rating system of light and dark. The defendant told others that with the help of Chad, she could rate people as light or dark. And pretty soon this theory evolved and these teachings evolved. And they started to say, well, if somebody's dark, an evil spirit or an evil entity can come in and they can push the real person out and take over the body. And the defendant and Chad Daybell talked about how you would get rid of these evil spirits. So the first thing they did was the defendant would lead castings. And you'll hear the castings described a little different by different witnesses, but with the idea being that there was prayer and energy work. They wouldn't have to be near the person that they were casting on, but they would get together and pray or do energy work to get rid of this evil spirit. You will also hear that these castings time and time again didn't work. But you'll hear that these teachings evolved and they evolved to, well, a person could be so dark or a spirit could be so evil that the person actually becomes a zombie. You can't cast a zombie out. But a common theme was the body had to be destroyed. The defendant and Chad used their self-proclaimed religious beliefs and teachings to justify their actions to others their actions from an affair to murder. This was especially true with regards to the defendant's brother, Alex Cox. You will hear how Alex and the defendant had an extremely close relationship. Alex would do anything for Lori. And you'll hear how when Alex would do anything for Lori, when she uprooted her life in Arizona, on or about September 1st of 2019 and moved up to Idaho and moved to Rexburg to be closer to Chad, that Alex quit his job and moved up to Rexburg with her. If Chad and Lori ask it, Alex did it. You will also hear how Alex Cox was taught by both the defendant and Chad Daybell that his purpose in this probation or this life or this creation, whichever term they use, 
was to protect Lori. He was a warrior, and he was here to protect Lori. When the defendant would talk about people being light and dark, she talked about her own daughter, Tylee, being dark. She told people this, and there's messages that she sent regarding this. But what you won't hear is anything about the defendant doing anything when Tylee went missing. There were no known actions taken by the defendant. No report to law enforcement, no missing person posters, no inquiries. Similarly with JJ, little seven-year-old boy. The defendant said he was dark. He was possessed. She told people this, there's messages about it. But again, what you won't hear is that when JJ went missing, that the defendant did anything. There are no known actions by the defendant to find JJ. No report to law enforcement, no missing person posters, no inquiries. You will hear how she described JJ's behaviors to others in an attempt to get them to agree that he must not be JJ anymore that an evil spirit must have taken over his body. And you will hear how she was very convincing. You'll hear from witnesses how they believed what Lori told them. She was likable, energetic, and they believed her. They wanted to believe her. They wanted to follow Lori. They wanted what she was saying to be true. You will also hear how she told a friend of hers named April Raymond, who's another woman that you will hear from, that when she got divorced that JJ would need to go live with Charles, his father, and that Charles would have to figure out what to do with him. And part of why she talked about this was that the defendant was also telling people that she was here on a mission. She was here on a religious mission to gather the 144,000. So she needed to spend her time and energy there. So JJ could go live with Charles because she had other things to do. She had more important things to do than care for her child. She expressed to people that what she did here on earth no longer counted for her. You'll hear how she'd hit her hand. Doesn't count for me. Doesn't count for me. She explained this to others by telling them that she was a translated being, and you'll hear more about that and what they taught with regards to that. But she convinced others that they were also in the translation process. Again, she's very convincing. People wanted to believe her. People trusted her. But what it really was was she and Chad using their proposed religious beliefs and teaching to manipulate those around them into not questioning their actions and what they were doing. Their actions did not always comport with their teachings, and so you'll hear how those teachings evolved. They changed over time to justify or to support the actions of the defendant and Chad Daybell. You will hear how the defendant told others, because she was translated, she didn't have to repent. Again, doesn't count for me. You'll also hear how when she and Alex first moved here, Alex was setting the Wi-Fi password. He tells Lori in a message, I set the password, too many kids. Lori's short response, funny. That's before the kids went missing when they moved here. In the month or so after her children were last seen, what you will hear is the defendant went on several trips. She went on a trip to Arizona, and that trip was around October 9th of 2019. And that's a date that you will hear about. The defendant went to Arizona to visit her niece, Melanie Boudreaux, also known as Melanie Pulowski, another individual that you will hear more about and you will hear from during this trial. While she was down visiting her niece, Zulema Pastenis came over. And Lori led a casting on Tammy. Meanwhile, back in Idaho, what you will hear is on October 9th of 2019, that same day, Tammy came home from work, 
parked her car, went to get things out of the back, and came face to face with a masked man holding a gun and pointing at her. You will hear how Tammy heard a couple pops and the gunman ran off. What you will also hear is that later, a phone call was overheard between Lori and an unknown individual. Lori was mad. On October 9th of 2019, she was mad. And she made a statement along the lines of, he can't do anything right. What we also know is that there was were some phone calls that night between she and at least Chad Dayville. Not long after that trip to Arizona, you will hear how Lori then traveled to Missouri with her niece, Melanie. And while in Missouri, they visited some sites, and then they met up with an individual named Audrey Bartario, another woman that you will hear more about and you will hear from during this trial. And while they were there in Missouri, Lori led another casting on Tammy. By this time, you'll hear that the defendant and Chad had determined Tammy was dark. Tammy was possessed. She was possessed by an evil spirit named Viola. Shortly after the trip to Missouri, you will hear how Tammy, or excuse me, how Lori then traveled to Hawaii. She traveled to Hawaii again with her niece, Melanie, and Audrey joined them while they were there. And Lori was actually in Hawaii at the time of Tammy's death on or about October 19th of 2019. You will, what you won't hear with any of these trips that the defendant went on, you won't hear about JJ or Tylee because they weren't with her. They weren't with her when she went to Arizona. They weren't with her when she went to Missouri and they were not with her when she went to Hawaii. But what you will hear about is how the defendant was still spending their money. She was also sending her other son, Colby, money using Tylee's phone. So Tylee's phone was with her, but Tylee wasn't. You will hear how when she was in Hawaii, she was in constant or consistent contact with Chad. You'll hear how just after Tammy died, she hurried back to Idaho. And just after returning to Idaho, you will hear how the defendant began to insert herself into Chad Daybell's life. It was as if Tammy never existed. The defendant met his kids, came to his house, and Chad started to introduce her to some of his friends. And you will hear how Chad introduced her to some of his neighbors a little over a week after Tammy's passing. And you'll hear from those neighbors, those friends of Chad's. And you will hear how when they were introduced to Lori for the first time, she and Chad couldn't keep their hands off each other. Tammy hasn't been dead that long. They talk about plans to get married, but maybe most interestingly, Chad Daybell makes a statement when Lori's asked about kids that she had a young daughter that had recently died. Lori says nothing about JJ. No mention of a young son. No correcting Chad on the whereabouts or if her daughter was alive or not. Just some indication about, well, I, I've got some stepkids. Not long after that meeting, the defendant was in Hawaii on a beach marrying Chad Daybell. They got married in Hawaii on November 5th of 2019. You will hear how the defendant had actually begun looking for Malachite wedding rings as early as May of 2019. You will hear how the Malachite stone was important to them. What you will also hear is on their wedding day, they exchanged Malachite rings. And in May of 2019, when the defendant was looking for those rings, both of their spouses were alive and well. You will hear also how Chad Daybell began checking into adding the defendant to his life insurance, or excuse me, to his health insurance policy. 
and when he went to fill out that application, you will hear how he said, no minor children. There's no minors that need to be added to this policy, just the defendant. You'll hear how similarly he was looking for a rental property for them in Hawaii. And on that application, same thing, no minor children, just Chad and Lori, just Chad and the defendant, just the way they wanted it. On November 26th of 2019, law enforcement showed up at the apartments located at 565 Pioneer Road in Rexburg, Idaho. They were looking for JJ. It was still unknown that Tylee was missing at this point. Chad Daybell was there with Alex Cox and law enforcement made contact with them. Finally, later that same day, they were able to contact the defendant regarding the whereabouts of JJ. The defendant was less than forthcoming with law enforcement at that time. She told law enforcement that JJ was with her friend Melanie Gibb in Arizona. The problem with this, she would told Melanie JJ was with Kay Woodcock, his grandmother. Problem with that, Kay Woodcock is the one that had reported JJ missing to law enforcement. So where was JJ? And where was Tylee for that matter? The defendant did not cooperate in locating them. Instead, when law enforcement returned, she cleared out her apartment and moved to Hawaii with Chad, her new husband. While Chad and Lori were starting their new life together in Hawaii, law enforcement had begun a massive search for JJ and Tylee. It became a nationwide search for those children. As they were searching for the children and beginning their investigation, they talked to Melanie Gibb because Lori had said that JJ was with Melanie. Melanie had been asked to not talk to law enforcement by Chad. She'd been asked to tell law enforcement JJ was with her by Lori, even so far as Lori saying, snap a picture of some kids. <coughs> Send it to law enforcement, basically. Melanie Gibb wasn't sure what to do, but eventually she came forward with, to law enforcement and said, JJ was never with me. Never had him. Don't know where he is. Because of everything that had gone on, Melanie Gibb, on December 8th of 2019, decides to place a phone call to Chad and the defendant. She wants to know, where's JJ? And why did you ask me to tell law enforcement he was with me? What's going on? She recorded that conversation. And what we know from that conversation and what you will hear is the defendant refused to disclose where JJ was, but claimed he was happy, claimed, and ultimately ended up saying she knew exactly where JJ was. I remind you, JJ was last seen on September 22nd of 2019. This is December 8th of 2019. And I'll remind you how JJ was found. And yet the defendant's statement to Melanie Gibb was, I know exactly where he is. When confronted about Tammy's death, the defendant indicated they did what they had to do. Now remember, Chad and Lori had determined Tammy was dark. And if someone's dark and castings don't work, the body has to be destroyed. They did what they had to do. The defendant and Chad did what they had to do to remove any and every obstacle that was in their way of getting exactly what they wanted. On December 11th of 2019, Tammy was removed from her restful, um, from her resting place to be examined. And it was determined by the office of the Utah Medical Examiner that Tammy died at the hands of another and that the cause of her death was asphyxiation. You will hear how around the time of Tammy's exhumation Alex Cox made a statement along the lines of, I hope I'm not their fall guy.
What exactly Alex meant by this or what he knew, we may never know, because Alex Cox died the next day on December 12th of 2019. What we do know, though, is there were communications between Alex Cox, the defendant, and Chad Daybell. We know in those conversations there was discussions of people being light and dark, and we know the location of Alex's phone and Chad's phone on certain dates and times. We know that on October 9th of 2019, the day Tammy was confronted by a masked gunman, that Alex Cox's phone had been in the area earlier in the day, driving by where the Daybell residence is located. The only person Alex Cox knew in the Salem area was Chad Daybell. We know that on September 9th of 2019, the morning after the last day Tylee is seen, we know Alex Cox's phone is in Chad Daybell's backyard on his property close to where Tylee's remains are found. We also know around that same time, Chad Daybell's phone is there on his property close to where Tylee's body is found. We also know from other witnesses that Alex Cox would do whatever the defendant and Chad asked him to do. He was loyal to them to a fault. You have already heard from the state that we have the burden in this case, but I want to reiterate that. We as the state have the burden to prove each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. You have heard that term and you will hear it again, reasonable doubt. The court is the judge of the law and the judge will give you the definition of the law. And the judge will specifically provide a definition of reasonable doubt and you follow his definition. But I will say reasonable doubt is commonly defined as a doubt that would cause a reasonable person to hesitate to act. And I would emphasize reasonable. The defendant is charged with multiple crimes and you just heard him in the indictment. Conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft in relation to the death of Tylee Ryan, her daughter. First degree murder in relation to the death of Tylee Ryan, her daughter. Conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft in relation to JJ Vallow, her son. First degree murder in relation to JJ Vallow, her son. Conspiracy to commit first degree murder in relation to Tammy Daybell. And grand theft for the taking of the Social Security monies. Again, the judge will advise you on the law, but keep in mind that when we talk about the term conspiracy, it is two or more persons combining or conspiring, so essentially a meeting of the minds to commit some crime. And then one of those actors, just one, has to do an overt act in furtherance of that conspiracy. Only one person has to do it, and there only has to be one overt act. What that means is the defendant doesn't have to be the one that physically ended anyone's life for her to be guilty of conspiracy. If you determine that there is a meeting of the minds and one actor did one overt act in furtherance of that. Similarly, in the state of Idaho, Idaho law allows for someone to be charged as a principal. When someone is charged as a principal to a crime, it can include them directly committing the act, aiding and abetting in its commission, or it can include them having advised and encouraged its commission or commanding or coercing another to commit the crime. So similarly, similarly, when you're hearing about the first degree murder, the defendant did not have to physically end someone's life for her to be guilty. First degree murder is deliberate, willful, and premeditated actions causing someone to die. Mind you, and circling back, when Tylee was found, as we talked about, 
All that was found was, ch was charred remains. Tylee's hands are gone. When JJ was found, his hands were bound and duct taped in front of his body. When Tammy was found, those hands, she was described as a computer whiz, never going to do anything on a computer again. And the defendant and Chad Daybell, getting married on a beach in Hawaii, starting their life together, all obstacles gone. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I thank you for being here today and your willingness to serve on the jury. We recognize that you do have a task here and you are the judge of facts. And I would let you know that that is the most important job in this courtroom. This is set to be a long trial and you're going to sit through a lot of evidence and a lot of testimony. What we ask you to do is be attentive to the testimony and evidence presented Apply your common sense and reasonableness in weighing the evidence. Give every piece of evidence and testimony the weight you think it is due. Hold us to our burden, and we feel that if you apply your reason and common sense, I'm confident that you will return a verdict of guilty in this case. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. That will conclude the opening statements for the state of Idaho. Will the defense be giving an opening statement now, or do you wish to defer until later? I'll give one now, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Archibald. You can present your opening now. Like the state of Idaho, I also thank you for your service. Uh, this is a difficult case, a case we have not been able to settle without you. Without you. That's why you've been called here to help us settle this case. Uh, if the court will allow a brief introduction. I know a lot about you with your 20-page questionnaires, so I'd like to just make a brief introduction of uh, the defense. Uh, I've been an attorney uh, since 1991. I've been both a private attorney and a public defender. And in small county Idaho, there's a lot of us lawyers who do both uh, public defense work and private work. And so uh, over the past 32 years, uh, I've I've done a, a bit of both. I've, I've been assigned to uh, 27 murder cases over the course of my career, and they're difficult. They're difficult cases. Uh, I was assigned to this case. Uh, I'm paid by the taxpayers, and so thank you for paying your taxes. Um, I, I've had a general practice where I, I do a little bit of everything. And, uh, and then I, I get about one of these difficult cases a year assigned to me, and, and we do what, what, what we can. What, what does a defense lawyer do? Uh, we make sure that our clients' constitutional rights are protected. We make sure that the government does its job. We make sure that proof beyond a reasonable doubt is in place before there's a uh, before there's a decision. So, so with these difficult cases, we resolve 99% of our cases. Less than 1% of cases actually make it to trial. And so, we, I believe, the state and the defense, uh, we generally do a good job of resolving our disputes. And sometimes, when we can't, then we we call on you to resolve it for us. I'm being assisted in this case uh, by 
uh, John Thomas. He's uh, uh, been a, an attorney since 1999. <laughs> he has also both experience in private law firms and public defender's offices, uh, where he's handled many, many serious cases. Uh, he's received many accolades for his lawyering, and I appreciate him helping me. Uh, I also am being assisted by Brandon Hobbs. You've probably seen him, and he's an investigator, and so he's he's helped us investigate this case. Um, being a defense lawyer isn't always a popular job, and I, so I appreciate you being respectful towards me, and I'll do the same. I'll be respectful towards you. Some eight years ago, my law office got bombed, and... Uh, and so uh, some people are really upset by, by what I do for a living. And so I appreciate you uh, and your ability to decide the facts of this case uh, without uh, emotion overriding your decision. So this case is about Lori Vallow Daybell. Uh, the prosecutor has just told you what the government hopes to prove throughout the next month. Uh, so what's this story about from our defense perspective? And how does this story include you? So the evidence will show that Lori was born and raised in California. She's lived in California, Texas, Arizona, and Hawaii. Uh, she lived in Idaho for less than a month before the event of what you're here to decide. She's one of six children. Uh, her parents are still alive. They're retired. Uh, she's had an older sister and a brother die, and she also has a sister and a brother still living. Uh, she believes in life after death, and she believes she will see her deceased family, including her children, again. She's a beautician by trade. She's worked hard for years in that profession. She's a mother of three, stepmother of two, and is now a grandmother of two children. The evidence will show that people were attracted to her, as the state has told you. They've been attracted to her pretty smile, her vivacious personality, her fun-loving, happy-go-lucky personality. People wanted to be around her. Her oldest son is Colby Ryan. He was born in 1996 in Texas. Uh, he's a handsome young man. He currently lives in Arizona. He has two children of his own, making Lori a grandma. Her oldest daughter, Tylee Ryan, was born in 2002 in Texas. She was a ray of sunshine. She had health problems, pancreatitis, a painful and debilitating disease, but Tylee did the best she could. Her marriage to Joe Ryan ended and a painful, long, drawn-out custody battle ensued. And it was hard on all of them. The evidence will show that her next husband, Charles Vallow, was smitten with her and she with him. He had two kids, she had two kids, and the blended family lasted over a decade. Lori was such a, a good, responsible mother to her two children that her husband's sister, Kay Woodcock, wanted her to adopt a special needs toddler, newborn. Kay Woodcock was the grandma to a child born in Louisiana in 2012, a child with special needs. The child's parents couldn't take care of him because of their own personal problems. Apparently, Kay Woodcock uh, couldn't take care of him either, so she asked her brother, Charles, and his wife, Lori, if they would adopt him, and they agreed. So the child born in Louisiana, the struggling parents, was adopted by Charles and Lori Vallow in 2014 and he became known as J.J. Vallow, Lori's third child. 
The evidence will show that Lori was a dutiful wife to Charles Vallow. They both worked hard, he at the office and she at home. She was a kind and loving mother to her children. The evidence will show she had a particular interest in religion in the end of times. You will recognize the quote unquote end of times as something spoken of in the Holy Bible, the New Testament. Most of you will understand when I say that. Some people could care less about biblical prophecies. Some people care a lot about it. Thankfully, in this country, we get to worship how we choose. The evidence will show that once Lori and her friends met Chad Daybell, an author on religious subjects, her beliefs began to morph and to change. And that's where you come into this story because the, the stories diverge. So we haven't been able to agree on what happened and we need you to decide it. So what happened? How did these children die? Who was involved? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Why? Why did it happen? The judge has read to you the allegations, the charges. And uh, so you've, they were read to you two weeks ago when you showed up to fill out your questionnaire. They were read again today. And I'm going to read parts of them again because I think it's important to see uh, what she's charged with. And you don't have to write these down, by the way. The jury instructions will be with you in the jury room. Uh, some of you are really good note takers, and some of you will let others take notes. Uh, but you, you don't need to memorize what I'm telling you, because these, these will be printed out and, and handed to you in the jury room. So the, the charge of conspiracy, Chad, Lori, Alex, deceased. Other co-conspirators, both known and unknown. So Chad Daybell is not on trial here. Alex Cox is not on trial here. He's deceased. Other co-conspirators, I don't know much about that, both known and unknown. So again, your focus will be on the actions of Lori. Not on Chad, not on Act, not on Alex, not on co-conspirators, both known and unknown. So that's the conspiracy. I think uh, first-degree murder. The allegations contained in in the charge that the judge read to you was Lori Vallow concerned in the commission of first-degree murder. Did. Or did she aid and abet? Did she assist somehow? Or, the language of the charge says, or not being present. Did she advise and encourage it to happen? Or, by command, compelled another? So, the this charge is did she kill or did she assist or did she encourage or did she command so in other words this charge is saying they're not sure what happened but yet they want you to be sure the same with count three and count four with JJ. Count five, five with Tammy. Did she combine or conspire to commit murder? Did she do the murder? Or did she talk about it? Or did she do something about it? Or did she do an act in furtherance of it? 
So that's the challenge here for you is you're going to be given all these al alternatives and you're going to have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. I didn't make up the definition for reasonable doubt, neither did the judge, neither did the prosecutors. But that's our law. He read it to you two weeks ago and again this morning, and here it is. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove her innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. The state must prove the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or, or from lack of evidence. So if you have a lack of evidence and that's reasonable to you, you're our reasonable people here for the next month. That's a reasonable doubt. If after considering all the evidence or the lack of evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about Lori's guilt, you must find her not guilty. in here, I lost my way. So uh, there's something called an alibi that was filed as part of this response, uh, part of these allegations. So here's the alibi that was filed on Lori's behalf. Lori Vallow was in her own apartment in Rexburg, Idaho, when J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan died in the apartment of Alex Cox in Rexburg, Idaho. Lori was with Melanie Gibb, David Warwick, and or Chad Daybell. And Lori was in Hawaii when Tammy Daybell died at the home of Chad Daybell in Salem, Idaho. Lori was with Melanie Bedreau and or Audrey Baratario in Hawaii. So that's the alibi filed in this case. And a lot of jurors were excused in this case because of pretrial publicity. We asked you a lot of questions about that, what you, what you knew, what you heard, what, if you can set it aside, and so far, still, no evidence had been presented to you. So my client is still presumed innocent. And the publicity that has tainted so many people throughout the county, through the state, through the nation, that's not evidence. And so I appreciate all of you stating that you, anything that you may have heard, a lot of you didn't hear anything, so thank you. But for those of you who did hear something, you can set that aside and start this trial with Lori with a clean slate. You're here to focus on what she did, not on what Chad Daybell did or what Alex Cox did. You're here to determine if there even was a conspiracy. Cases, again, can be solved with evidence. They can be solved with lack of evidence.
And when there's lack of evidence, the law calls it not guilty. You said you would be fair and impartial. You said you would have an open mind to not judge her until you heard all the evidence in this courtroom. You said you would do your duty, and I believe you. If what the state has alleged here cannot be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you said you would find her not guilty. Thank you for your attention.